it almost seems counterintuitive for us as children of God to realize that one of the most powerful things that we can do is to surrender. One of the most powerful things that we can do in our lives. And, our, and I, I hope that in this study in the book of Acts that you've come to realize that what we're continually doing is continually surrendering to him. Continually surrendering to be used by him. Continually to be surrendering to be changed by him and to trans, be transformed by him. So we, we, are, we are thrilled this morning to once again have an opportunity to jump into God's word. And to see what the book of Acts has to say uh, for us. I love this. I love this series. I love this series because it stirs up so much in me that I had forgotten. So, so much in me that I, principles that I, I truly needed to know and truly needed uh, uh, to, to be restored in uh, this morning. So we're going to be looking at Acts the fourth chapter this morning. Acts the fourth chapter as we as we continue in our study of the book, uh, book of Acts. We're going to be actually, if you notice in your notes in the, in the bulletin, uh, I've got verses 1 through 22. Uh, for a text, we're going to take verses 1 through 14. But let me encourage you this week, uh, if you get an opportunity to sit down and read that, we're going to be referring to a lot of those scriptures in the latter part of that, in the latter part of that. But I want you to read, if you get a chance, read through that entire section and see uh, the truths that God, hopefully it'll bring some, some things to mind that we talk about this morning and as we explore today. Today. So let's look at let's look at what what took place. This these events took place immediately following the miracle that took place uh, at the gate called Beautiful. And we'll, the week uh, so two weeks ago we looked at that miracle. Then we last week we looked at the sermon that Simon Peter preached. Now we're going to look at the response to that sermon and and what the what the temple uh, uh, officials did to to Peter and John and how they responded in the midst of it. And it reads like this. Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day. For it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander. And as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and marveled and un, uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. I want to speak simply from this thought this morning, resistance training, resistance training. Training. Lord, we're so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful for your mercy, Lord God. We're thankful, Lord God, for your word. It's the word, Lord God, that gives us the strength, Lord, to stand, Lord God, to resist, Lord Jesus, to be what you've called us to be. Anoint us today, God. It's your word into our hearts, into our minds, Lord God, that we will leave this place changed, transformed into your very image. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Do we have any high school athletes in, uh, with us? Whether it was here years ago, any, anybody in this place? We got, yes, we got, we got a few high school athletes. Do, do we have anybody here that, that works out with weights? That has ever picked up a weight? 
Yes, yes, excellent, 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 excellent. Well, then you, I'm going to cast a wide net in, in, talk, in talking uh, th this morning. Uh, you, if, if you worked in athletics or if you've been in a gym where you had some coach barking at you or, some, or somebody t talking to you, you've probably heard the word resistance training or it could be called strength training. It, it's, when, uh, it's, it's a very simple principle. It's a very simple thing that is used. It's, it's when uh, people have come to realize that to build muscle, that that muscle has to be confronted by resistance. That there has to be something that is against it and is pushing against it and that, so that that muscle can build and grow. What, one of the things that they'll do is when you go into a gym, they'll hand you a certain set of weights that they think you can handle and they say, here, work out with these. And you work out with those a day or so. You go home, you're sore. You feel like you're going to die. You, the next, they say, give it a day to rest and your body to heal. Then come back the day after that and do it all over again. And you do that again and again until you begin to feel comfortable with that set of weights. If you get comfortable with that weight, you know what it's time to do then? It's time to get heavier weights. The resistance needs to be increased. You do that and you, and you go through the entire process again until, until months later you're lifting heavier and heavier weights. They've come to realize that to build muscle there must be resistance against those muscles. They must be a consistent, a, a constant application of that resistance upon their... You see the goal is not to see how much you can lift. The goal is not to see, not to see what, what you can accomplish accomplish in the gym. The goal is growth. The goal is to develop strength, is to develop stamina, is to develop muscle, is to develop a better shape, is to develop a better healthy lifestyle. Well, let me tell you this morning, I'm here to tell you this morning that God has his own resistance training. God has his own system where he applies resistance or allows the resistance to be applied to our lives for the very same reason so that we can be strong so that we can be mature, so that we can be per per persevere in the middle of trials and tri tri tribulations, so that we might be able to grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus puts us through what I call some resistance training. Now, now what does that have to do with our text? Well, in chapter 4, something happens in the church of Jesus Christ that will happen almost every encounter from this step forward. Something happens in this book that will happen throughout the, church, the history of the church. Something will start here that will not stop and it hasn't stopped even to the day. And what was that, Derek? That means that the church all of a sudden ran headlong into resistance. They run headlong into people that hated them, into people that resisted them, into people that would fight against them, into people that would cause difficulty in their hearts and in their lives. And God allows this to take place. But he doesn't just allow this to take place. These men of God quickly learn to embrace resistance. Right, what are you talking about, Derek? Aren't we supposed to come against resistance? Uh, if you look in the book of Acts, you'll see again and again, God's people come to realize something. God can use the very things the enemy throws at you. God can use the very things that the enemy tries to destroy you with. God can use the very strategies, the very warfare of the enemy to bring to your life victory like you've never seen or you've never experienced before. You see, he, he doesn't just work, move in spite of the resistance. He oftentimes moves through the resistance. He oftentimes moves in the resistance to bring about his purpose and his plan. So that leads us this morning to today's power principle. No, not quite. Today's power principle. Listen to what, what, what today's power principle is. As a citizen of heaven, you are being both designed and equipped for resistance. Now you need to understand that both of these things are, are crucial uh, if we're going to grow in the grace of God. First of all, we are being designed. We're, we're being equipped. In other words, we're given the tools, but not only are we given the tools, we're undergoing change. We're undergoing transformation. We're developing the skill set to be what, what, what they need to be. Any carpenters in the house? Any carpenters? Yeah, Mike, 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 huh? What? What? Carp if you've ever had a young guy come on the site with his brand new shiny hammer, and then you let him loose 
on a nail, you don't want to see that nail when you're finished with it. It's going to be all over the place. You see, he has the, he has the strength. He has, he has the, the ability uh, built into him. But he doesn't have the skill built into him. He doesn't have the experience built into him. What God wants to do is he wants to put in us the skill to endure. The skill to be effective in time of trial. The skill to step forward and to accomplish what God has called us to do. So that it's a two-part thing in our life. He's going to give you the tools but he's also going to design in your life and transform your life so that you can be more than conqueror in Jesus Christ. So that you can be an overcomer in the situations and the circumstances. We can't be an overcomer if there's nothing to overcome. We can't be more than a conqueror if there's nothing to conquer. We, all these things are dependent upon the fact that we have been designed for difficulty. Oh, brother, don't tell me that. I didn't want to hear, I didn't want to hear that, that I was designed for difficulty. That explains a lot about my week that I just had, uh, that I've been designed for difficulty. But let me tell you, Jesus will give us the keys in God's word to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Now, let me clarify something before we go any further this morning. The, the resistance I'm talking about is the resistance against a child of God who is determined to do the will of God and determined to be a part of what God is doing and the resistance that naturally comes from the forces outside of him. Can I say emphatically before you all, every difficulty in your life is not an attack of the devil. Every time, everything that you're facing is not coming from, from the devil. I've talked to people throughout the year, my years in ministry, they'll come to me, Pastor, 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 Pastor. The devil is attacking me on every side. And, and the longer I talk to them, the more I realize it's not the devil at all. They made bad choices. They made bad decisions. They made bad turns. And these are the fruit of those decisions and the fruit of those turns. Now God can help you in those times as well. God can give you grace in those times as well. But the starting point at those times is to recognize that I am partly responsible for my situation or my circumstance. But this morning we're not addressing that. This morning we're addressing those difficulties that we face when we try to do what God's called us to do. Those resistance that we get from the outside forces and from the enemies that surrounding us as we begin to look at what happened when Simon, Peter, and John stood up, preached the word of God, and the resulting resistance that become come apart. So we're going to, we're going to see two things this, this morning. Two things that's, that, that we're going to look at. First, we're going to look at the sources of their resistance. And then we're going to look at the resources in their resistance this morning. First of all, let's look at the sources of their resistance. If we're, going, if we're going to truly face the difficulties in life and truly face the difficulties that come against us, we need to know where those difficulties are coming from. We need to know the sources that they're coming from. We need to know how to face them. We can't afford to be shocked when difficulty arrives. We can't afford to be overthrown. We can't afford to be discouraged. We can't be, afford to be crushed when, 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 when resistance come our way, we've got to recognize and, notif- and notice the sources. Now, as we go through the book of Acts, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice that the sources of resistance will come from every angle, from every side, from family members to the government, uh, to the culture that surround them, from, to, from religion, from all kinds of sources. This, this resistance is going to come. And this morning, we're not going to try to pinpoint every one of those sources. we got the entire book of Acts to do that. And, we, and we'll, we'll look at that. We're going to look at the resistance that came against these two men, the resistance that revealed themselves in this specific text. So first of all, I want you to realize that the, the, the sources of our resistance will first of all come from some very surprising places. You see, we kind of expect the world to kick against us, don't we? We kind of expect the culture to fight against us. But when we are resisted by the very people that we think should be our allies, when we're resisted by the very people, then it doesn't make sense why they're resisting us. They should be on our side. People that are pew sitters sometimes. People that, people that, that know the word of God and know what God's word has to say. Sometimes we find ourselves kind of perplexed when we find ourselves resisted by the religious. Notice what he said in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the next few verses. Verse number one. Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees come upon them. Religious. 
being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Let me tell you, the greatest resistance that Jesus ever faced wasn't from Rome. The greatest resistance that Jesus ever faced wasn't from the culture that he walked in and he lived in. The greatest resistance that helped nail him to that tree was those religious folk crying crucify him, crying do away with him. You see, religion was the greatest resistance against Jesus. As we look through the book of Acts, you're going to find out another thing. Religion was the greatest resistance against the early church. The religious culture in which they lived. The religious culture in which they walked. Now let me make some things clear so that you understand our terminology this morning. First of all, it is not the same thing to have religion and to have Jesus. Let me clarify that. You can be the most religious person in the world and not know him. You can have all the titles. You can have all the positions. You can be a deacon. You can be an elder. You can be a Sunday school teacher. You can be a member for 78 years or or more. And if you don't know him, you don't know him. You can be as religious as you want to be. The Sadducees was religious. The Pharisees was religious. The chief priests were religious. But they did not know Jesus Christ. See, religion is all about what's superficial. It's all about how things look and how things sound. You know, they're all about putting on a good show. They're all about having, having the mask on on Sunday morning. They're all, about, they're all about putting on a good show. They're all about having the right positions. But when it comes to it, to them, God is all about what we do and not about who we are. Not about what God's doing in our lives. You see, the religion is one of the greatest substitutes for a relationship with God. It is one of the greatest substitutes for really walking with God, talking with God, living with God, being what God God would have for us, us to be. Religion is dead works, but r- r- relationship with Jesus is living. You see, that was one of the things that condemned the Sadducees that day. It condemned the Pharisees that day. What they had, had was dead, cold, and dry, and lifeless. But what was they were seeing before them was a living Jesus flowing through his people, touching his people. I don't know about you. I don't need religion. You can take your religion. You can have your religion. You can have all the denominational... Uh, the accolades you want I want Jesus just give me Jesus give me more and more of Jesus because he is the way and he is the life so be careful it's subtle if you put on a mask to come here on Sunday mornings but you live by a completely different set of standards all through the week you're religious you're not having a relationship with Jesus Christ and if you're not careful the devil can use you To tear down those that he is using, that God is using. To tear down those and to oppose those. Every major revival that has taken place in America. Every major revival that has broken out through England and through the world. Every one of them was resisted by by the church folk. Every one of them was resisted by those who should have known better. Who should have recognized God. Who should have recognized what God was doing. You see, we can be surprised by the resistance that may come from us. From pulpits. From churches. How do I know if I'm religious? And how do I know if i got a relationship? Paul said in Galatians, there is fruit of the Spirit. Peace, joy, kindness, love, mercy. These are the fruits that prove that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. If you're religious, there's a different set of fruit. Condemnation, judgment. Anger, hatred, uh, 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 self-righteousness. These are the fruits of religion. But when you walk with Jesus, you act like Jesus. When you walk with Jesus, you love like Jesus. When you walk with Jesus, you forgive like Jesus. And sometimes all of us is tempted to be a little religious. But it's time to shake that off and say, Lord God, help me. Lord Jesus, to realize that it can come from some very surprising places. Also, but there's something that I want you to realize more than anything this this morning. I want you to realize that when it comes to the sources and our resistance, that, 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 that ultimately it comes from one major source. 
We need to realize that when, when things come against us. We need to realize that because the early church understood a principle that we desperately need to understand. They understood a principle that we desperately need to, 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 to grasp a hold of. Paul outlines it in, in Ephesians 6, 12. Notice what he said. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What was Paul saying? First of all, he is saying, we do not wrestle with, somebody talk to me, flesh and blood. What is he saying? Your enemy is not people. Your enemy is not the government. As much as we'd love it for it to be. Your enemy is, is, not, is, not, is not our culture that we live in. Your enemy is not those. It's what is behind that that is the enemy. It is what is, is, is the system that the, that the enemy, the devil, and all the kingdom of darkness is against. They understood that their problem was not in Rome. They understood that their problem was not in the, in the religious system of Judaism. They understood their problem was not in the culture in which they lived. They understood their problem problem was the kingdom of darkness. They understood that the devil with all of his network of influences, all of his network of pulling strings, all of his network. And so when you understand that, you fight on a different battlefield. I don't know how prayer is going to help, but then you don't understand the battlefield we're on. I don't know how quoting scripture is going to help, but you don't understand what we're up against. They acted pretty religious standing in the middle of those places. And I, I mean that, I mean that in, in the sense that, 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 that they stood for Jesus and they stood for what God had. They acted, I'm not religious, they, they acted fairly spiritual. Why? Because they understood that they weren't standing in front of the Sanhedrin. They were standing in front of the, in front of the kingdom of darkness. And the problems that they were facing was a, a heaven against hell. The problem that they were facing was the darkness against light. The problem they were facing was a much greater one. Church, we will never succeed in doing what Jesus has called us to do until we realize where the ultimate source comes from. Where we realize that it's not standing against everything and everyone around us, but it's stand, taking a stand for Jesus Christ and to realize that Jesus can be, have victory over the forces of the devil. So we need, to re, we need to understand that it is the ultimate source for your life. It is the ultimate source for what you have and what you're coming up against. Why is that important? Because I've seen Christians attack non-Christians and just wound them forever. They're blind. They're dead according to the scriptures. They can't even comprehend what you're talking about. They can't even comprehend spiritual matters. You want to really help them? Talk to them about the love of God and pour into them and pour into them the grace of God and then pray, 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 pray. Did I say pray? pray that God will open their eyes and open their hearts? Why? Because you're fighting a different war. You're fighting a different battle. Your resistance is not from those around you. It's from it's from principalities uh, near you. Now let's take a look at the resources in the in our times. Of resistance. There are certain keys, there are certain tools that we have been given. We have been given a tremendous toolbox when it comes to fight, when to come to facing resistance. That we become a tremendous toolbox that God's word gives us that will teach us when you are under attack of the devil, use these things. The, the, the Peter and John demonstrates the power of these things in our life. They demonstrate what we need in time of difficulty and time of trouble. We need anchors in times of trouble. I was born and raised in the southeast. All that I knew that was mountains was the Great Smoky Mountains. That was all I, I knew. Then I got a phone call. That was about five and a half years ago. Somebody said, how would you like to move to Colorado? I'm like, mm, yeah, mm, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So we packed up our house and we hillbillies moved from South Carolina out, out to Colorado. I thought we, I thought we, had, uh, we had seen mountains before. Then I got and stood in front. We were 40 minutes away from the Great Smoky Mountains. And I re realized why they called it, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, not the Great Smoky Mountains, the Rocky Mountains. I began to realize why they called it the Rocky Mountains. Because many of those mountains were nothing more than a rock face that stretched into the sky. And when you're riding around out there, you don't realize how big those mountains are until you realize that you look up and you see a speck 
on the side of that mountain and you realize that's a crazy person. That is somebody that has decided to scale that mountain. Climbers, I've always been infatuated with mountain climbers. I've never been so infatuated that I want to follow them. <laughs> Believe me. Or even, or even try it. But it, it always blew my mind. But one thing they'll teach you in, in mountain climbing is you've got to know how to anchor yourself to the face of that rock. You've got to know how to find that crack, that crevice, where you can take that anchor and you can put it in there. And that anchor has to be strong enough where it will hold the resistance of your weight. You don't want it slipping out. You don't want it moving. You don't want to tie it to a twig. You don't want to shove it in a piece of dirt. You want to make sure that it's embedded in the face of that rock before you move and before you go any farther. Because when you fall back, you need something that's going to hold you. What are you falling back on this morning? What is it that supports you when trouble comes? What is it that, that holds your weight and holds the, and is stronger than the resistance that you're facing? What is it that is the various things in your life that is the resources that God has given you? If you're trying anything else, some of us think we can outsmart trouble. Some of us think we can outstress trouble. <sighs> right? Some of us think that, we, that, we, that, uh, that all we have to do is just, just wait it out. Sometimes waiting it out is just not enough. But God has placed some tools in your hands that will provide you with everything that you need to endure the hardships. First tool that I noticed, and I know it almost sounds stereotypical, but it is, it is, it is truly uh, one of the most powerful tools that you can have. That tool is the Word of God. The Word of God is what the early church relied on. It's what the early church trusted in. It's what the early church found their comfort in. It's what the early church found their hope in. Every time they turned around, they run into the wall, they run into problems, they run into situation. They said, I'll just lean on the Word of God. No matter how things look, no matter how things sound, the Word will prevail. They believe that without apology. They believe that without explanation. They believe that. Notice what happened. In, in the, notice what it said in verse number 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's 2,000 more on the day of Pentecost. It is estimated at this time the church was about 10,000 strong. Let's do that next week. You, you, let's do that next week. Anybody all over? It, it would, we would be crazy if we had 10,000 people show up for service next. Happy, but crazy. But you see why in the middle of their trouble didn't things fall apart? Because they understood no matter what happens, God's word will prevail. No matter what goes on in our midst, God's word is going to prevail. They declared it with the top of their lungs. They declared it with everything that was within them. They declared it with everything that they had in their hearts and their lives. They said, oh, I, we can trust the word of God. I like what Paul said. He was in a prison cell, locked away behind bars. And he's writing letters to the church. And one of the phrases that he said, I'm bound, but the word of God is not Bound. In other words, you can lock me up all you want, but you can't lock up the Word of God. You can, do, you can treat me the way you want to treat me, but the Word of God will prevail. If you want something to hold you in the middle of the resistance, if you want something to hold your weight and to hold the resistance that is coming your way, take a hold to the Word of God. You'll find that it is more than enough to do what you need it to do. Believe it. Trust it. A couple of weeks back, I preached a sermon that looking back, I realized the devil tried to edit. I preached a sermon on the miracle that took place when the, the man at the gate was lifted up. And I preached a principle that the devil said, you may, might, might want to just cut that from your sermon. And that principle is that when the word of God goes forth, it can, it, God often confirms it with signs and wonders. And all that week, the devil's saying, why don't you just cut that? Because if you don't, if you don't cut that, you're going to have to, you're going to have to live up to that. You're going to pray for people and they ain't going to be healed. You're going to pray for people and nothing's going to change. And you're just going to put, you're going to put, bring shame to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know, I'm crazy enough to believe this book says what it means and means what it says. 
I'm crazy enough to believe that Jesus is still the healer. That Jesus is still the one that can touch our bodies and move our hearts. So that morning I went ahead and crazy pastor that you got preached it just the way I read it. Preached it just the way I, I taught it. And, and at the end of it I, 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 said, I said we're going to have a time of prayer around these, uh, around these altars. Anybody that needs prayer for sickness won't, won't you come and we'll lay hands on you and we'll pray for you and anybody else that, that, that feels like you need to go just go ahead and go. There was a handful of us that met, met down at the front of this church but we weren't alone. Jesus met us here at the front of that church uh, that, that morning and we begin to lay hands on people, anoint them, lay hands on people and in the name of Jesus Christ begin to pray over them. Did every prayer get answered? No, not every prayer got answered. But I am still to this day hearing reports of healings that have taken place because of one simple time. Oh, I heard somebody this past week told me they had a son oh, that, that, that we prayed for down here that the doctors diagnosed his cancer and he went back this past week and the doctor doctor said, I can't explain it. There is no cancer there anymore. Let me tell you, we still serve a Jesus that heals. We still serve a Jesus that answers. We still serve a Jesus that we can stand on his word. Healed feet. Healed backs. Healed circumstances and situations. Good doctor reports instead of bad doctor reports. Why? Because the word of God stands well, I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe in nature. How's that working for you? Oh, I don't believe that. I, I, believe, I, believe, I believe that you know, the solution is going to be this political party or that political party. How's that working for you? It doesn't. But heaven and earth shall pass away. But not one jot or not one tittle of this book will fail, according to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe that. I stand on that. That's where, my, that's where I'm tethered to. That's where I'm locked into the rock. That's, and that is the word of God in our life. And then, then, then secondly, I want you to notice the answers. Now, I look at another verse here, if you will. Verse number 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Immediately, I, my mind went to something that Jesus had told his disciples. And I believe immediately the disciples remembered the very same word. Notice what Jesus said. Luke 12, 11 through 12. And this is stunning in the detail that Jesus gives here. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and to the magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in the very hour that you what you ought to say. He said, guys, don't worry about it. When you stand against the authorities, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the answer right then and there. This little sermon that, that Simon Peter gave them with all the boldness that he gave them was straight from heaven's throne. It was straight from the very, from the very mouth of, 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 of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God had promised them, I'll give you the answers when you need it. When you arrive, there's the answers. We fret about all kinds of things. We worry about all kinds of things. We worry about what we're going to say and do and how we're going to act. But Jesus has given us a promise. When you need me, I'll be there. I started a little storefront church years ago, my first pastoral endeavor. And we started by meeting in a little, in a, in a little, little hotel conference room. Just a handful of us singing songs to God and, and getting into the Word. We, we would rent that room out every Sunday. And one Sunday we went to the front desk and the desk manager looked at us and said, I got some bad news for you. He said, what's that? He said, the hotel manager don't like you being here. And he has said that you're gone as soon as he can get in touch with you and, and, and meet with you. So I went to work the next week, barely in my 20s. And I worried until that phone rang. And it was a secretary from his office saying, he would like to meet you today, talk to you today. 
This little scrawny fella got out there in my little jalopy, one colored door, the d- d- door colored, d- 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 uh, it drove down the road sideways because it had been hit by a school bus before I, before I bought it. It was junk. It was just junk, but it got me from point A to point B. I had to wear my blue jeans and my tennis shoes and my T-shirt. I was a child driving to meet the general manager of this hotel. And I remember driving on the way, looking up to heaven and saying, God, what have you got me into? I'm about to lose the very only place that we have together. Lose the very only place that we have. And I don't know how to deal with this. And he brought this scripture to my mind. And a peace came over my soul like I never experienced before. And I went up to the general manager's office. Walked in the door, got sat in one of those big old intimidating chairs. The guy around the, behind the desk crossed, his arms crossed with his scowl on his face. And the first thing he said was not how you doing. He said, this will not work. You're a church, you're meeting right down the hall from my bar that I have here in the hotel. This will not work. I know it doesn't meet at the same time, but this will not work. I want you out of there. All of a sudden, something rose up in that little kid, that little 20-something-year-old boy that I hadn't felt in, in a very long time. It was a boldness. I scooted to the edge of my seat and I looked at him. I said, sir, your hotel has entered into an agreement with my church. And because you've entered into agreement with my church, we will meet there as long as we deem necessary to meet there. You will not raise the rate. You will not charge us more than you want us to charge. He says, I, I said, you do not want to violate this. Do you understand, sir? He looked like he had seen a ghost. He scooted back and he said, of course, have a nice day. I got up and I walked out of that room saying, what, what was all that? I went to work the very next day and, and uh, one of the engineers that worked with me there at the boat company uh, uh, coming up to me and said, Derek, are you starting a church out in, at, at, at Lakefront uh, Hotel? I'm like, uh, Yeah. Yeah, he said, did you meet with the general manager yesterday? I said, yeah. He said, well, I was sitting at the bar the other night. And he said, I mean, last night, he said, all of a sudden, this guy comes sitting beside me. It looked like he had the weight of the world on him. As he sat beside, as he sat beside he said, we, I introduced myself, he introduced himself, and we talked for a little while. It was the general manager at the hotel down the way. And he said, he all of a sudden just blurted it out. He said, there is this little church that is trying to sue me for religious discrimination. And I know what their plan is. And I know what they're out to do. I'm not going to play that game. I'm going to leave them alone. I wasn't going to take him to court, but he did meet the advocate that day because my Lord stepped in just when this old little boy that didn't know what to do, what to say, stepped up. I believe that's how Peter and John felt. They were standing before the very same board that sent Jesus to the cross. They were standing before the very same people that had condemned him. But all of a sudden, there was a boldness that rose up within them because Jesus had said, one of the keys is going to be, I will give you the answers. Another tool that they notice is the very presence of Jesus. Well, the authority, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I've skipped one, the authority of Jesus. I'm going to quickly skip through that. We've touched on that time, time and time again. In other words, God had their back. When they spoke, they did not speak from their own authority, from their own uh, position, from their, what, their own desires. They were standing as representatives of the kingdom of God. And they declared, it was by the name of Jesus Christ, no matter who you are, what you are, if you are standing in the name of Jesus Christ, if you're standing in the authority of Jesus Christ, let me tell you, God's got your back. And then thirdly, fourthly, I'm sorry, I can't count. Public education at work. The presence of Jesus. This was something that they didn't mention, but it was something that was mentioned about them. Notice what it said in the scriptures. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Why could they stand with such boldness? Because Jesus 
was standing with them. This was not just something that they did today. This was something they did every day. They practiced the presence of Jesus Christ in their midst. If you want your week to go much smaller, I mean, much, much, one, much easier, invite him in. Invite him to walk with you. On your lunch break, talk with him, to pray with, to pray to him. Let the presence of Jesus into your life. No matter what you're going through, you can make it if he's there. No matter what you're facing, you can make it if you know that he's standing there with you. They hadn't, Jesus had been gone from the scene for weeks. But yet they said, we can tell the signs. We can tell the evidence that these two men has been with Jesus. Oh, that the Lord may grant us with the very same grace. That Freeport will say, I don't know what it is about that church, but there are Jesus people. There are people that shines forth the grace of who he is and what he is in their life. I can make it. I can take it. I can go through whatever I need to go through as long as I practice the very presence of Jesus as I go there. You do it on your own, you're going to crumble and be crushed. You do it in your own wisdom, in your own knowledge, in your own understanding, you're going to find out just how foolish you are. But if you do it with Jesus, you're going to find out, he, he, as he promised his disciples, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And then finally, the last tool is a tool that we don't really even think about as being a tool in times of resistance. And that is an act, the act of obedience. Notice what Simon Peter told, uh, told these men. These, notice what happened. They had, they had, he had, Simon Peter preaches a little sermonette. I like that. He preaches, the, he preaches to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is so bold that he was going to teach the Sadducees, the Pharisees, something about God. And he was, and he was, and he was declaring it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And after they heard it, they just kind of wagged their head. And then this is how they responded. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, Whether is it right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were telling them, we don't have any problem with what you believe. The culture is telling us we don't have any problem with you believing as long as you don't talk about it. As long as you don't witness about it. As long as you don't bring it up. But, but I like what Peter and John said. We can't but help but to preach what we've seen. To preach what we've heard. We can't help but to obey God. Let me tell you, church, if you want to know what do I do next in this problem, what do I do next in this situation, keep doing what he last told you to do. There's comfort in knowing that I can obey God and continue to obey God. This is one tool that the devil would love for you to just toss to the wayside. Because he understands something. It is through the obedience of God's people that God unleashes the kingdom of God in their midst. It's those simple acts of obedience. Those simple going to, through the things that they were last told to do. Last told how they were last told to obey. We need to realize that obedience is in fact a truth that we need to hold on to. A truth that we need to, to say yes Lord to. Because that, that, that tool of obedience is that that unlocks for us. It unleashes for us what God wants for your life. Obey him. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. I've got trouble in my life. Are you obeying him? Well, yes. Keep obeying him and he'll show up. Keep serving him and he'll be revealed in your life. If you're not obeying him, you're on your own. I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to do it your way, God will let you do it your way. And he'll let you reap that way uh, uh, accordingly. But if you will say, Lord, I choose to obey you, you can find the grace of God. God has given us the tools to resist the enemy. Tools to resist the attacks of the devil. You know, th these, are, these are the only things that really work in our life. These are only ways that we can really resist in our life. The word of God. The answer of the Spirit in our lives. The authority of the name of Jesus. The presence of Jesus in our life. And then obeying Him in all that we do. Resistance training. Anybody feel a little sore? <laughs> 
as we begin to lift the weights of what God has for us. Would you stand with us? Life can be difficult. Life can be tough. And you add to that when we try to obey God and try to do what God wants to do, the difficulty that comes so often from the enemy attacking us and striking back at us. But let me tell you one thing that we have. We have the promises that God can even take that attack and turn it around to bless us. Like Joseph, we can declare, enemy, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. That's just the way God likes to work. And God has called us to be, to be resistant to the enemy. And to stand firm with the enemy. To stand upon his word. To trust in him. To rely on him during those times. So that he can turn us into conquerors in Jesus Christ. I wondered this morning, you say, you say well, 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 Pastor... I just need a little strength today. I just need some. I just feel like the whole world has come against me. I just feel like the struggles of this life has become more for me to handle. Stress is off the charts right now, Derek. The situations around me is just, it's just more than I can bear. Would you just lift your hands this morning? We just lift you. Just be, be honest with us this morning. Just lift your hands and say, say, say you're talking about me, Pastor. You're talking about me. Oh, he wants to touch our life. Would, would you do me a favor, church? Would you look around if you see a hand raised? Would you, if they're, they're near you, would you just make your way to that, to that individual and lay hands on that individual? We're going to have, we're going to have prayer. We're gonna have, if there's any more that you would like, you'd like to be prayed for, for strength, would you just lift your hands right now? I believe that God's grace and God's mercy will be revealed in your life and, and, and in your hearts. Uh, yes, don't be, don't be... It's just us. It's just family. If you need strength from the Lord, would you just raise your hand? There's people who wants to pray with you in this room. <laughs> uh, would you stretch your hand? If you're not near those individuals, would you just stretch your hand? Lord Jesus, we look to you right now, Lord God. You who strengthen the weak in arms, Lord God. The strengthen, strengthen the weak in, uh, Lord Jesus, the, the weak in ones within your body. Lord Jesus, we know that you can give us strength where there is no strength. You can give us wisdom where there is no wisdom. That you can give us help where there is no help. Lord Jesus, right now, you see that, these uplifted hands, Lord God. You see these, Lord Jesus, that are in need of your power, need of your anointing, need of your grace, Lord Jesus. You know the need. You know the situation even greater than, than we do, Lord Jesus. Be with them, Lord God. Anoint them, Lord God. May they leave this place knowing that the very presence of Jesus is with them and that the very presence of the Holy Spirit is within them, Lord God. Be with them, Lord Jesus. Bless them in this house. Bless them in this place, Lord Jesus. Anoint them, strengthen them, Lord Jesus. As they go throughout their week, may they find strength every day in you, God. May they find hope every day in you, Lord God. May they find life every day in you, Lord Jesus. And as we see your hand move upon them, God, we'll be quick to give you the glory. We'll be quick to say it is our Lord and our God that has strengthened us and has lifted us, Lord God, has enabled us at this very time. In Jesus' name we ask it. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Be back with us next Sunday. Amen. It's